Pastor Lewis and Leanne, for the privilege of being here. I was just adding up. You guys have, uh, with Layla and Lacey, you have six L's, six A's, three E's, three I's, two N's, one G, one H, one Y, one U, one Z, one R, and your collective names. I love this. Lewis, Leanne, Lacey, Layla. You have amazing pastors. And I had the chance to just observe your pastor. If you want to know how a pastor survives COVID, one of the most difficult times in memory for pastors with all of the social unrest, you saw him up here worshiping God and crying out to God. That's how a pastor leads into the future. You are blessed with your pastors. Can we give them a round of applause? Amen. My uh, family cannot be here. My wife is uh, an interim worship leader while we're back in the U.S. We're on a furlough itineration. Um, I think we have a photo of our kids. My son Oliver is uh, 18, graduating high school. Since he was a, a little tiny kid, he's wanted to work with rockets. And uh, so he's uh, on track to go into uh, an aerospace uh, engineering program. And um, Ava, as you can see by the look on her face, her goal is to take over the planet. Um, I love uh, my kids, my wife, Olivia. Um, Olivia's an amazing leader. She's uh, not just a, a worship leader and a singer. Uh, she's an author. I have uh, some of her books back there. If you'd like to check out our stories, we started out in Armenia, and I'll tell you a little bit about Armenia. We're there two terms. Uh, first, Assemblies of God missionaries to open up the country of Armenia. And then God called us to go to Estonia. We had not had uh, missionaries from our organization in Estonia. And God called us to lead a church planning team, 12 missionaries. We arrived there. Uh, the national church um, had about 30 churches, the average size 18 people. And uh, God blessed us with a team. The national church said, go ahead and, and do what God's called you to do. We can't help you. Um, it doesn't quite make sense that Americans would come and, uh, and reach Estonians, one of the least religious people groups in the world. If you Google Estonia, um, what will come up are all kinds of demographic studies, even very recent ones, where the Estonian people group consider themselves, but also the demographic studies, uh, studies show that in, in, the, in Europe, uh, least uh, religious country by different metrics, if you ask an Estonian, as we would when we would just walk the streets investigating and praying, God, do you want us to leave Armenia where we had established a, a Bible college? We had 215 pastors who had survived 70 years of Soviet atheism, Soviet communism, uh, had never had a chance to study in a Bible school. Um, we had launched the Full Life Study Bible Project, the Fire Bible Project, and had all those notes translated. We had a staff of 11 translators. We were working with starting up women's ministry, which had never been done. Olivia was taking women out to villages where there had never been a church. And uh, we were investigating, God, do you really want us to leave this? We speak the language. Uh, our, our best friends in the world are Armenian people. And um, we get to uh, Estonia, and the national church says, we really don't think it's going to work. But if God's calling you, we'll allow you to, uh, to come and do it. So we, we went. God bless us with a team of 12 missionaries. Some of your missionaries, Bob and Chrissy Godwin, came and joined our team for about a year and a half before they launched their church. But we, we did everything we possibly could think of to do to reach people who were not... They were not just uh, not religious. They were not just secular people. They, they weren't even thinking about their worldview. There was, there was no existential crisis. They, they had the fastest growing economy, economy of the former Soviet Union. They were kind of technological rock stars around the world. Estonia is one of the most high-tech countries in the world with Skype as a startup there with the entire country covered in, in free uh, wireless internet. Some of the biggest tech startups in the world started in this tiny little country uh, up by Finland. And um, they were just so, so introverted. They were so closed that it was even difficult to talk to them about Jesus. They say you can tell the difference between an Estonian 
introvert and an Estonian extrovert because the extrovert will not look at his shoes like the introvert, but will look at your shoes. That's the the Estonian. Extremely difficult languages, language, one of the most difficult languages in the world to learn. Um, And we realized that it had to be God. So God began to show up. He gave us uh, a family to take over for all of our projects in Armenia, and they flourished, and God began to give us team members, and he began to bless uh, financially for the startup funds for all of this. We did a year of outreach, and on that very first Sunday, um, I believe it was nine years ago, eight and a half years ago, we had 74 people show up to that first Sunday. So the largest uh, the average size church was about 18 people. By that first Easter, 150 people came. Easter's your biggest Sunday, but it's kind of a metric of how many relationships that we had formed in a country that wasn't looking to go to church on Easter. Uh, by our second Easter, we had 250, and we just were recently there after turning that church over to the first Estonian to come to Christ in that church plant, uh, Pastor Kristin Kuhl. Uh, We were just there literally last week, and the church is thriving, it's growing. Um, They're hitting those uh, weekend attendance numbers, uh, all high numbers, and um, it is just amazing to see what God has done. We're now area directors over seven countries, which include Ukraine. God gave us a vision five years ago when we became area directors to, to see church planting movements break out virally among all of the the people groups. And so we began to just uh, train our missionaries on how uh, we went about uh, doing evangelism, how we discipled so that disciples will multiply. So we have disciple making disciples. And then as uh, you guys experienced here, as we were just getting ready to launch this huge vision, the world shut down, COVID shut down, and then a war breaks out in Ukraine. But God is still doing amazing things. In fact, it seems, if you study church history, that in the places where the church and the people were persecuted the most, the church grew faster and more exponentially. One of the, the families that, um, that are part of our Ukraine team, 26 missionaries in Ukraine had to flee. We had to help them get out. One of those missionaries was able to have 150 conversations one-on-one bringing people to the gospel and praying with them as they were leaving from the capital city, Kiev, out to, to Poland. And those types of stories are repeated over and over and over. God is doing absolutely amazing things. And I, I don't really have time to tell you all of the projects, all of the things that our, our people are doing, like uh, Gerald and Jane Dollar, who Gerald is still, still there in Ukraine, and he's, he has access to the most difficult and dangerous Uh, cities and towns in Ukraine, and we're ramping up projects to rebuild churches once the war is over. We're already in the process of raising funds to rebuild churches. Every church that we know of, every church building that we know of is being used as a refugee center to feed people, to distribute uh, food and clothing that um, organizations like Convoy of Hope and other organizations are sending in at the risk of the lives of these pastors who go to the border with trucks and with semis and come back with bullets coming from Russian MiGs, risking their lives. We've lost a couple of pastors as they have gone to deliver food. But pray with us for Ukraine. Pray that our missionaries have access, uh, that people will continue to remain open to the gospel. I just want to jump really quick into the message. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come up um, right at uh, 12.05. Whether I'm done or not, that'll just signal, because I'm going to try to speed through this. It'll signal to me that I just, wherever I'm at, I get a land. Um, read with me. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 1, this um, missions month that you're in has a theme from John 3, 16. Maybe we can read that. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This was the gospel. This was the good news that Jesus preached. And when Jesus went from town to town and village to village, the Bible says that he proclaimed, his message was, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's, it's available. 
If your translation says something like uh, the kingdom of God is, is, uh, is, is among you or is near, they're trying to translate from the Greek a concept that we can really only gather from reading all four of the Gospels, reading the entire New Testament. The, the message of Jesus was that the kingdom of God that was promised that we read and uh, for his audience they, 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 they read in their Hebrew scriptures that they, they memorized if they were good students uh, up until age 12, they would have memorized the first five books of the Bible. And uh, if they had done a good job, if they had proven themselves, they could have been streamed into the school of a, of a famous rabbi. Jesus was going town to town, village to village, talking to people about this kingdom that they had read about, that they had learned about, that they had memorized scripture about, that they expected. And he was explaining to them what this kingdom was like so that they wouldn't miss it. And in Matthew chapter 20, I'm not gonna read the, the, the whole story. This is a story that Jesus tells where he says, the kingdom of heaven, in Matthew chapter 20 verse one, is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And I think the New International Version translate this, this Greek word for master of the house um, accurately when, when, it, when it describes the landowner. This is in Greek, the oikos despotos, the despot of the family. This was, this was the big cheese. This was the big honcho. This, was the, the, this wasn't just a steward. This wasn't just a manager of the, of the house. And when Jesus said this, I believe that his audience immediately sat up on the edge of their seat because he was telling a story that was proceeding in a way that they would not have expected. When we went to Armenia, we were uh, just a few hundred miles from Baghdad as uh, the crow flies. We, uh, Mount Ararat was on the horizon outside of our house, 17,000 foot mountain. We were um, surrounded by uh, Islamic nations, uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan, and uh, Armenians have been a part, uh, integrated into the Middle East. Really, if you go way back into the Old Testament, they were contemporaries of King Solomon. This is where Noah's Ark is, this the mountains of Ararat. So this is Armenian territory. So as we arrived there, I grew up in uh, Kansas City, and if you are maybe 45 and older, uh, and you grew up watching Wizard of Oz on television, we weren't in Kansas anymore. I had never been to this part of the world. It was a strange culture. We arrived, it was a former Soviet Union, but you had this Middle Eastern culture just mixed together. And this old Soviet airport was this concrete monstrosity that was crumbling and leaking. And we arrive at four o'clock in the morning and that's just full of our, our Armenian men uh, coming in, inside of the building, past security, uh, this just strange culture to, to us, helping their family get their bags off of the, the baggage conveyor belt. And this was after 9-11, uh, so security was tight in all the airports, but this was strange to us. And they're, they're coming in and they're smoking inside the building. They're dressed in black from head to toe. At the time, Armenian men wore these long, pointy black dress shoes. And I just see all of this, and I was like, Lord, where have you brought us? I look over at my wife. I, now, I grew up uh, kind of, my brothers and I, I'm one of uh, four boys. We're kind of rough and tumble, hooligan-type Kids, I, we, we hiked the Grand Canyon together, you know, four days we hiked through. Uh, uh, that's our idea of fun and adventure. My wife's idea of, of an adventure, of roughing it, is that unrenovated wing of the Marriott Hotel downtown, you know? And I look at her, and her, her, she's just in total shock. Uh, the first day we go out to the market, there's no Super Target, there's no Super Walmart, there's no Bucky's uh, on, the, on the highway. There were no grocery stores. You, you shopped in open markets. You haggled uh, for the price. And as we walked into where the fresh vegetables, the, the fresh greens were being sold in this indoor market was, was the butcher stalls that led, uh, uh, that the, lined the path into the market. And it was a hot, it was 100 uh, plus degrees. Uh, it was dry. It was a, a dusty sidewalk. And the blood and guts from those pigs and, 
and uh, cows and chickens. They're Orthodox Christians, so they had, they had pigs. They're allowed to eat pork. And it was just all that blood and guts just running into the sidewalk. And I just see my wife just tiptoeing through and just seeing, like, the, the stress. And I was enjoying every single minute, minute of this. But we soon began to realize that this culture was so different. We had to get a speed the light vehicle. Uh, speed the light is this program and the assemblies of God across the U.S. where our youth groups raise money and buy vehicles and sound equipment for our missionaries. And uh, we didn't trust the banks at the time, so our area director said, uh, just bring all the cash with you on the plane. So I had uh, white knuckled all of that cash, and he said, okay, let's go. F he met us there. He said, let's go find a car. I got to fly out and leave the country. Let's get you settled in. And uh, here we are, 26 years old. My wife was 24, and um, we go to meet a guy. There were no, there were no dealerships. And uh, the, the pastors there said, we know a guy who uh, just recently brought a Toyota 4Runner, one of these uh, four-wheel drives, and, uh, and it's for sale. Brought it in from Dubai on a container, and we're going to go meet him. I remember meeting them as if it was yesterday, at least in my memory. It was like, the, like uh, a Sopranos episode or a Godfather movie. We, we pull off on the side of, side of the highway. There's a black Land Cruiser in front of us, all the windows are blacked out. I was with Hovanes Hovakimian, one of the wealthiest men in Armenia. He was a Christian that the pastors trusted. He was the guy that knew the guy that had uh, an SUV, a, 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 a Toyota four-wheel drive that we could buy. So we pull up in Hovanes' uh, Land Cruiser behind this other guy's Land Cruiser. I remember the four doors opening. And in my mind, it's all in slow motion because they come out, their, their, their shirt's unbuttoned, they have the black chest hair billowing out, gold chains, gold teeth, and they're walking in slow motion. And I'm sitting in the back of Havanas' Land Cruiser, and I'm like, Lord God, what are we doing here? So we make the deal, we count out and U.S. $100 bills in somebody's home is a neutral third party because they said, we, we, don't, uh, we can't give you the car until it's registered. The police will pull you over. So Havana said, don't worry about it. I'll help you get your car registered. And so we went from government office to government office with Hovannis. He wouldn't let us try it on our own. And uh, so we had to wait for him to be free. He was ru running the largest uh, um, meat company in the country, sausage and ham and things like that. And so he would take us, we'd go into a government office, and uh, he would just walk into the office of the most important person in, in this national uh, government office building. He would walk into uh, the most important person's room. He wouldn't knock on the door. He would open the door. And as I'm freaking out, you know, because we, we take numbers at the DMV and we wait in line. There's a mass of people. He passes by everybody. He walks in, and I would see this government official recognize Hovannis, would stand up, and he would walk to him. He would kind of uh, humble his body language. He would shake his hand, kiss him on both cheeks, and begin to show hospitality to Hovannis, talking to him by his first and his last name, and say, what can we do for you? So after a month of this, we finally figure out, Hovannis figures out how to register the car in the name of a foreigner. And we're in this last stage. And by this time as an American, you can imagine being without a car for a month. I was, I was entering into PTSD. I was starting to shake. Because as an American, we just can't go without, you know, our car. And so we're going to get the license plate. And Hovannis turns to me at this police station and he says, Nick, what numbers do you want on your license plate? And I had no idea why he was asking me this question. It, it just came out of the blue. I, I was thinking, well, in America we have vanity plates, but that's kind of weird. But, and uh, I was just thinking, like, as long as it's not 666, I'm okay. Just give, give us something. And he comes back out of the, the, the police chief's office. He has license plates in his hands. And he's smiling from ear to ear. And he says through um, a friend that was helping us interpreting, he says, he says, Nick John, now John in that part of the world is a term of, of endearment, Nick John, he said, they had my, my numbers, my license plate numbers here. And he was almost in tears with joy. <laughs> and I had no idea what he was talking about. I, would just, I just wanted to get those license plates on the car. <laughs> I wanted to drive. 
So eventually we get the license plates on and we start to drive. Now, I had learned how to drive from Hovannis where he would come up to a stoplight. He would turn to me in a few English words that he knew. He would say, suggestion. And he would kind of slow down to make sure nobody was coming. He, he, the police couldn't pull him over. And so I'm like, okay. So I'm driving and I see the police set up on the side of the road. They would pull people over. And the way that they earned their salary was to get a, like a $2 bribe from from drivers that they could bully. And so I see these uh, police set up on the side of the road and I see that stick come out, point to, they're gonna point at my car like they do everyone else, tell me to pull over. And so I'm kind of preparing myself, I'm getting nervous, and I see that police officer raise that stick up and he's looking and then that stick just disappears and he walks away. And so I, I had slowed down, nothing happened, and so I move on. And this starts to happen again and again. So I go to my friend who was helping us. His name was Samson. He was helping us learn Armenian. And I said, Samson, what is this about? And Samson, who was uh, about my, my same age, he was in his mid-20s at the time, he looks at me and he's like, you, you don't know? He said, Nick, you have hit the jackpot. You have won the lottery. Every young man in Armenia wishes they were you. The police can't pull you over. You can drive however you want. And Hovannis, the sausage king of, of Armenia, is your, is your covering. You are a part of his family. Your license plates, he had 777 on all of his vehicles, his son's car, his wife's car, all of his delivery vehicles. And everywhere he went in the country, people knew that this was Hovannis. And I began to realize, living there, that in that culture, you wear your status with you at all times. And Hovannis would never have been caught dead going out to the market in Armenia, in this Middle Eastern city, where the day laborers would gather. He would never allow himself to be seen in that car with those license plates where everybody can see him, knowing his status. He would send a son, he would send a manager. And if we back up 2,000 years into Jewish history, into Middle Eastern culture. We come to the time of Jesus where the rabbis would be noticed as they walked down the street by the colors on their clothes, by the way their hair was, was uh, designed, where, the way it was kept, the way it was oiled, the smell that was on that rabbi would be, they would wear, they would walk through the streets with an entourage. And here Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire day laborers. He goes into this marketplace in a Middle Eastern city. And we can see this in the Old Testament. The kings would set up council in the gate of the city. This is where the marketplace would be. This is where the people come out from the countryside into the city. And the people from the city, the elite, the wealthy, the government officials, those who had the ability, the wherewithal, the, the finances to, to afford to live within the walls, the safe walls of the city. Those who had business there in the city, they would meet in this wide open gate. And about four years ago, we were in Israel. We went up to the north, uh, north of the Sea of Galilee. And they have the oldest excavated city gate that they've found in any, anywhere in the world. And uh, one of our colleagues is a Harvard um, a, uh, graduate, master's from Harvard in Near Eastern Studies, and he, he lives there in Israel, and he said that there was a saying that when the king was in place sitting on his throne at the gate, and we saw where the throne was, that the people would be at peace. This is where the king would sit and he would hold counsel. So in the imagination of Jesus' audience right now, he, they are imagining someone who was a landowner, someone who could trace their lineage back to the original 12 tribes, or somebody who, who had the, the financial ability to, to rent the land so that he could have a vineyard. This was someone of means, someone who had a large enough harvest that they would come desperately into the marketplace to hire day laborers. But in this story, this landowner was doing something that nobody would have ever expected. He was violating cultural protocol. Because in, in their time and in our time in this part of the world, you don't 
manage your outward appearance, having the right license plate on your car. The, the son of the president had 111 on all of his cars and all of his businesses. The, one of the mafia guys who had control over all the bra imports, and they, not to his face, but behind his back, called him uh, Lefiki Samo. Le, Lef is uh, Russian slang for bra. He, okay, so this guy had 555 on all of his cars. The style of car, the, well, the, the cost of your car, the cleanliness of the car. I, as a missionary, I had to keep my car clean. I had to keep my shoes clean. I had to dress nice. Not to prove to people who I was, but because I was carrying the weight of responsibility of the group of pastors, persecuted Pentecostal pastors, who every single day on television, the Armenian Orthodox Church at the time, they've They've, they've changed drastically at the time. They would name the names of these pastors that had invited me into their family, into their tribe. They would name the names of their churches that were growing from 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000. Churches that had, when we moved there, were 2,000, had grown to 10,000. And they were warning people about these Pentecostal pastors. These pastors had invited us into their family. And I carried the weight of responsibility for their reputation everywhere that I went. And so Jesus' audience is hearing a story about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus starts this story by saying, in the kingdom of heaven, the first will be last and the last will be first. And woven throughout this story is Jesus' upside down kingdom. Or maybe we should say Jesus' right side up kingdom. But the kingdoms of this world are established in a certain way that the religious elite the financial elite, the wealthy, the healthy even, in Jewish understanding, if you had a sickness, it was because of some kind of sin that you committed or your family committed. And Jesus comes and he says, no, the kingdom of heaven is now available. And he would go from village to village, town to town. He would go into the capital city and he would touch the people who were untouchable. He, instead of the leprosy making him unclean, the holiness and the power of God would reach out to people and make them clean and make them whole and make them holy. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven has come. It's come in power and it's available to anyone and everyone. And he tells the story of a landowner who's so desperate to bring in his harvest that he violates this cultural protocol and he goes hour after hour after hour and he comes to the very end of the day as the sun is going down they had maybe half an hour to reach his vineyard by foot and he says it's worth it all I will pay you a full day's wage and the primary message of this story we, we need to make sure that when we preach and talk about parables that we don't Make them do things that they're not supposed to do, okay? The primary message is that the kingdom of God and all of the, the promises of God, the rewards of God, the, the in interaction with God, the, the family business of God is available to those who started early in the morning, but it's also available to those who had been overlooked, unwanted, perhaps. Think about this. Those who had been standing around all day and they weren't hired, were mixed with people who didn't get up in the morning and get out on time. They maybe were drunk or hung over that night and uh, mother-in-law comes into the room and rips them out of bed and says, you lazy bum, go and get a job, get a half a day's wage, get a quarter day's wage. And this landowner comes in and he says, I'm so desperate for the harvest that I will be generous with you. So just three takeaways. Number one, God wants to use you. Some of you here may, may think of yourself in, in these terms that I'm not a part of the chosen, the religious elite. Jesus went around and he chose people that had not been streamed into the best rabbi schools. It wasn't until Paul where we see someone who was, who was a, a, a brilliant and bright student whose teacher, Gamaliel, was, was one of the four most famous rabbis in all of history. They would write about Gamaliel that when he died, the power and glory of the Torah ceased. This was Paul. Paul was elite. But here we have the 12. We have guys like Peter, who's, who's, who's just a, a businessman. 
and ceremonially unclean at any given time because he's touching dead fish. He would have to go through all kinds, days-long rituals to get himself ready just to go up to the temple, to be, to be uh, the kind of guy you wanted to sit next to in synagogue on Saturday. He chose the tax collector, the kind of guy who sold out his brothers and his uncles to the occupying Roman government by bribing them so that he could collect taxes from them. Jesus went to these kinds of guys, to freedom fighters who were guilty of murder and insurrection, unauthorized by God. And he says, the kingdom, of, is, the kingdom of God is available to you right now. Come and follow me. This morning, Jesus is saying to every single person in this place, he wants to use you. He wants to use you. The second thing, and literally on the drive down here, God was speaking to me about this, and I have never really seen this. I've never really talked about this or taught this. But at the end of the story... There are people who were grumbling because they had borne the heat and the burden of the day and been promised a full day's wage. But here are people who'd worked two hours, three hours, 30 minutes, and the master of the house comes and he says to his steward, pay them a full, pay them everything I agreed. And you can just see in the story, Jesus is painting a picture of this landowner who's so full of joy and he's so generous. He's like, just bless them all. Bless them all. It's like Oprah giving away cars. Like, let them all have a car. <laughs> and then you have these people who, who are grumbling, and Jesus call, says, friend, are you upset because of my generosity? And this word friend, Jesus himself uses it two times to address somebody else. So I had to look all this up as God was just honing me in on this word friend. So I looked it up in the Greek, and this Greek word for friend is kind of a strange Greek word. The meaning is more like compatriot. Like you are an insider. You're an insider. Hey, insider, someone who knows a lot about theology, knows all about uh, the Hebrew Bible, someone who should maybe know better than what you're doing right now, friend, the two other times he addresses somebody else's friend, or he, he uses this as when he, te uh, he tells a story of a king who was throwing a, 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 a party, a feast, and the people that were supposed to come, the people that knew to come, didn't come, so he opened it up to anybody and everybody. And people came in, all kinds came in, but there was somebody who came in who, who wasn't dressed in a in the appropriate clothes for that venue, for that party. And this king addresses this person and says, friend, where are your wedding garments? And the point that Jesus was making there is that there are people who come and they enjoy the blessings of the kingdom of God, but their heart is not in the right place. They're there just because there's friends there. There's, they're there because somebody promise them that, that, that they will be, they could get rich if they give to God or what, whatever it may be, but they were there and they were not there with the fear of God. They had lost sight of the mission and the purpose of God. And Jesus uses this as well when Judas comes to the garden with soldiers to arrest Jesus. And he looks at him and he says, friend. And I don't know why this is weighing so heavily on me this morning, but I think if this is for you, that God's gonna speak to you and he's gonna illuminate this for you. Is when God looks at people who should know better, who have completely misunderstood that this, what we were, are doing, is about the establishment of the kingdom of God now, not just when we die and we go to heaven. That's, that's, that's Plato's vision of life. That's not Jesus' vision of life. He said the kingdom of heaven is now. The he heaven is gonna come down onto this earth, and God is gonna renew this earth. You are gonna rule and reign with God, and that all begins now. Heaven starts now, and it starts as we apprentice ourselves 
to Jesus and he teaches us how to live in his kingdom, teaches us how to live by faith. I love this quote from George Mueller in the 18th century who never asked for money for his missions projects and his orphanages, but he prayed it in. He said, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. Wycliffe uh, goes by George Mueller's, at least they used to. Wycliffe goes by George Mueller's whole philosophy. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. That's what this is about. That's what Jesus is trying to get across. He's saying, I'm generous. And lastly, there are people that maybe only you can reach. Show a photo of Vera North, retired school teacher, uh, my, my uh, Sunday school teacher. She helped me memorize some scriptures. She had to use bribes. She would give me a quarter if I memorized the memory verse. But I remember her looking at me and saying, Nick, God wants to use you. God is going to use you greatly. And there are people here who um, you may never go to Ukraine. You may never go to Indonesia. You may never translate the scriptures into a language so that people for the first time in their life. But you partner with God. And there may be somebody in your life who becomes the next missionary that goes out, but you definitely partner here with a church that's raising up people to love God, to put him first, and to rejoice when those who come at the end of the day, those people who come in here from maybe another country, who from another socioeconomic status, come in with another language than, that besides what your language is, and you can rejoice with the Lord of the harvest that they get to be involved too. And all of the blessings of the kingdom, all the promises of the kingdom are brought to bear on anyone who will simply put their hand in the hand of Jesus and say, I want to be a part of the family business. I want to help establish your kingdom. And you can rejoice in that. Vera North spoke into my life as we were leaving Armenia. My wife Olivia uh, decided to go next door. We were at a pastor's house up in the the plateau, Kurdish villages, uh, Yezidi Kurds, uh, 50,000 of them. We worked with a pastor. It was the first pastor on that plateau. Uh, He said every single home in his village had come to Christ except for his neighbors. And Olivia, my wife, heard that, and she said, well, let's go next door and talk to him. She grabbed the pastor's wife to translate from Armenian into northern Kurdish, Kermanji, and and we had a group of uh, young ladies that were doing an internship, and they went next door. Olivia said when she walked into their house, dirt floor, she saw a girl in the corner, and the mother of the house comes out of the kitchen, she, she sees the guests, and she barks orders and kermanji at this girl. She gets up, she goes into the kitchen. All the women are sitting in a circle. She brings in the coffee, the tea, the cookies, sets a tray, and she goes back to her corner. And Olivia said that her heart sparked. She went to the corner, she put her arm around the girl, asked her name. Her name is Delore. And she said, you come and you sit with the rest of the women. And the mother started just to erupt in, in, in anger and yelling, and it was all in northern Kur- Kurdish. Later, the pastor's wife translated, said uh, she's just very, very upset at this daughter-in-law of their firstborn son because after years of trying, they haven't been able to get pregnant. And in their culture, Yezidi Kurdish culture, her life is over. She's sent back to her parents, and, and the pastor's wife said they're on the verge of sending her back to her parents, and in our understanding, she's cursed. And there are times, you can Google this, where Yezidi Kurdish brothers will end the curse on their family, generational curse, by, by killing their, their sister. And she's, the pastor's wife is just in tears, and Olivia's heart breaks. Our, our kids both came um, through miracles, uh, infertility that my wife suffered with. And her heart broke, and we began to pray for Delora. We began to bring doctors and visit. And we found out just a few months uh, before we were leaving Armenia and closing everything down to go to Estonia that um, we found out she was pregnant. And so we, we visited, and literally on our last, last day in Armenia, we had shipped all of our stuff off by boat. We were going to fly out the next day. We had been in the north 
preaching at one of our, our, our friend's churches up north, driving back over that plateau, 7,000 feet in the mountains, some of the worst roads you can imagine. And Olivia had packed the back of the car with diapers and, and all kinds of clothes and supplies. And Dolores Village, Pastor Boris's village, was 30 minutes off of the main, like, two-lane highway. So in the, late at night, we drive into Dolores Village. We park in front of her house. And Olivia goes in. I, I said, I'm, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. You deal with this. Like, you, you know, just, uh, I got to protect the kids. The kids are asleep in the back of the car. So Olivia goes in. 30 minutes later, she comes out. I get out of the car. I see everybody's got tears in their eyes. We say our goodbyes. We get back in the car. We're driving away. And I look at Olivia. I'm like, what happened? She just tears in her eyes. And she said, the pregnancy's going well. And we had a good time. And Olivia's a, a writer. She loves drama. She just is drawing this out for effect. I'm like, no, 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 no. Tell me what happened. Something happened. And she said, well, I asked them if they wanted to receive Jesus. And every single member of that household prayed with me to receive Jesus. The last household in that village of 250 people on that 7,000-foot plateau in Armenia, the pastor Boris is the pastor there. Praise God. God wants to use you. And there are people that maybe only you can reach. Jesus said in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, this morning you have already been moving, and I know you're calling people. I know you're speaking to people. Lord, I pray that this church would continue to be a beacon of light to the nations as they band together to send your light to the ends of the earth, to send missionaries to the end of the earth. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us right now in Jesus' name about what you want us to do in this year in our faith promises. You would speak to us now about what you want us to do in the next few years, about maybe going and participating in the mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Pastor Lewis.